This is Washington Policy on the Go, Washington Policy Center's official podcast. My name is Miranda Hawkins, the Young Professionals Director at Washington Policy Center. Young Professionals is a program for ages 18 to 40 year olds designed to educate and engage young people on um, our free market principles that WPC um, works with. Today I have the pleasure of interviewing Professor Cliff Mass. He is a climate and weather scientist and a professor of atmospheric sciences at the University of Washington. Um, he was recently involved in um, a big uproar about his view on initiative um, 1631 and um, as one Climate scientist said he was um, a victim of academic political bullying. So, Cliff, please tell us a little bit about what happened on the university. Well, the, the big issue was my support of 1631. I mean, there was a number of people, especially some of the, uh, the environmental activists that were very unhappy with, with, the role, with the role I played. You know, and basically, you know, I, I was in the opposition. Um, it's not that I... I'm not worried about climate change. I think climate change is a serious issue. And I actually do support carbon taxes. I was very involved with 732, uh, which was the previous carbon tax that was revenue neutral. I think the, the big thing is I thought that 1631 was very poorly designed, was, was poor public policy, and so, and so I was against it. And when did it all start? I think you had a, a blog post you wrote in mid-October um, detailing why you opposed 1631, and then what was the response? Well, a number of people were very unhappy with my, my several blogs about 1631. And, uh, I mean, it's okay to have policy differences, but you know, some people started into name-calling and they felt it was racist and it was demeaning or misogynist or, or whatever. And uh, I, I don't think that's true. Uh, I mean, basically, it was, I was going over what I thought were the policy deficiencies of 1631. Um, things such as uh, the fact it was very regressive. Um, it, it was taxing uh, poor people really at a higher rate than, than more wealthier people. I thought that, that was a real problem. I thought the fact it gave authority to spend huge amounts of money to a uh, unelected board, I thought that was a problem. And I had other, there's other, other deficiencies I thought in it. So I, I was against it. But uh, a, a number of, of groups, a number of, you know, particularly activist groups, um, were very much upset with the fact that I was opposing it. And it went, you know, pretty wild on places like Twitter, you know, where some very negative things were said. So, Professor Mass, what were some of the, the names or accusations towards you? Well, the names were varied, but a number of, of individuals felt it was racist to be against this initiative. And they felt I was also hurting uh, poor people and low-income people and minority people. So there were a lot of accusations about that. Um, I think that these were... These charges were very unfounded. Um, I felt there were serious policy deficiencies with 1631. Uh, giving billions of dollars to an unelected board as an example. I thought the carbon tax was actually too low to be effective. Um, there, were a lot, there were a lot of, I think, serious problems with the way it was constructed. Uh, and among which, I should, I should add, the fact it was highly regressive. The, w the way it worked, low-income people would pay a you know, much heavier burden than, than people that were wealthier. So I didn't think it had a chance. I thought it was going to go down, and, and in fact it did. It, it, it lost by 13 points. Yeah, and you know I read that um, campaigner Izzy Goodman, she tweeted that your, your view on I-1631, your, your, the take you had on it, she quoted, this alone proves that he is a blatant racist. You know, I thought those kind of comments were very unfortunate. Um, I think we need to be able to talk in the public sphere about measures like this and talk concretely. You know, is it regressive or not? Is it going to be effective or not? I think we can talk about the positives and negatives of the p policy without calling each other names. 
So, which leads me into my next question. Did anyone ever come up to you saying, hey, I really disagree with your view. Can we grab coffee? Can we put on a debate on campus? Can we put on a forum where we hear your different views because you were in the minority on campus? And so did, any, did anyone actually set up a respectful environment where they could hear you out? Did you get any feedback out like that? I wasn't invited to have such a debate, but there was a debate that occurred on campus, and this was run by some, some policy people here at the UW. Um, uh, Asim Prakash uh, organized this as there's, there's a, there's a public policy program. And he didn't have me do it, that he had the spokeswoman for 1631 give, give, give that side. So there, there was a give and take about about it. I wasn't involved. I wasn't invited to be okay. involved. Yeah. Okay. So I think it's really interesting that the 2016 revenue neutral carbon tax you endorsed. Um, and this one would have increased energy taxes and decreased sales taxes, I believe. Um, That's correct. But the 2018 carbon tax you opposed. So in your view, what are the biggest differences between the, those two? Well, there are major differences. The one thing I feel very strongly is that if we are going to move forward dealing with uh, climate change and reducing CO2, we have to do it in a bipartisan way. I mean, it's, you know, we have a big country and it's split, and the o only by working together are we going to make effective policy and make effective change. Now, 732 was actually quite bipartisan. There were people on both sides of the aisle involved in it, and it was, some, it was a measure that was revenue neutral. So it didn't enrich state government. All the money was being given back to the population, to the citizens of Washington State. And so there was a support uh, from prominent Republicans and prominent Democrats. There was, a, there was a lot, I thought it was pretty good policy. Also, it wasn't regressive. The way it was, to, it was uh, constructed, um, they gave large amount of, a large percentage, not all of it, but you know, maybe 25%, uh, for a low-income tax credit that would make low-income people whole. And also by giving the refund for the sales tax, that would also reduce the regressivity of our tax structure in our state. So actually, it, it was very good in, the, in terms of tax policy as well. So I really believe in carbon taxes in the sense that if, if something is bad, you tax it and then let the free market find the optimal approach. That's how 732 was designed. Okay. On the other hand, 1631 was very different. Um, it, it didn't deal with the regressivity issue. It basically pulled money out of the population, and, and lower-income people would be hurt more. And then, instead of giving the money back, it basically set up a huge fund that would be distributed essentially by one political party. Um, basically, the governor uh, would appoint people to this committee which would have the ability to distribute the money as they see fit. And even worse than that, some of the money was hardwired into special interest groups, for instance. And not actually going towards fixing the carbon issue, right? That's right. Well, supposedly they were going to use it for something dealing with climate change, but there was no guarantee. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, the tribes got 10 percent, uh, labor got $50 million a year hardwired. So they were hardwired in certain special interest groups, and mostly of one political party, were hardwired into getting the money, and the board that distributed the money also hardwired some of the some of the positions were, were people from from these groups as well. So it it was very very partisan. It was very regressive, and I also thought uh, there was no guarantee the money would be spent for you know the measures that really were important. So there were a lot of flaws with it. So what is your next step on on campus and your role with the climate change issue? I mean, do you see us, you know, in future years going back to an initiative like 732? Do you, is there an ideal, like, professor mass plan that you have in an ideal world you would like to see us go forward with? Well, unfortunately, um, the carbon tax approach, I think, is heavily damaged by losing twice. And in fact, it was the same group that made it, lo it lose. Basically, some of the environmental left folks were against 732. Uh, that's probably why it lost. The fact the governor and a lot of the environmental left groups actually opposed it. 
The oh. Sierra Club was against it, for instance. Why did they oppose it? Well, because they wanted to get some of the money. Oh, okay. So basically, they wanted a, a, an approach where the money was distributed to their favored programs. And the fact that they didn't get that, that they, they, they opposed it for that reason. So they opposed 732, and then they proposed their own approach, which failed. So basically, the, the, they, re, they resulted in the failure twice of, of some kind of measure. So now things are pretty damaged. So they're damaged, but what do you see as an optimistic approach for the future? You know, how do you have do you have a, a game plan in mind for how you're going to be continue to be involved in this issue and ways that we as young professionals, um, people, our listeners, um, can expect to see in the next couple of years? Well, I think there are two possible approaches. Um, one would be to go back and try to do a revenue-neutral, bipartisan carbon tax and do it right. You know, there were a few issues that we could have cleaned up with 732. Do 732 right. That's one possibility. Okay. The other possibility which is what I call a hybrid. You know, bring in money through some kind of carbon tax or fee. Use a substantial proportion to make sure the lower-income people are whole, okay? So maybe reducing sales tax or whatever. And then use the rest of the money for very concrete, very important needs. And I'll give you an example uh, trying to deal with wildfires. Um, it is clear that the, key, that the key driver of the wildfires in our state and other places is not climate change, but mismanagement of the forests and the fact we've suppressed fires for so long. What we need to do is to thin the forests, clean out the debris, and bring back low-level fire again as the fires that had burned for thousands of years. So imagine a, an initiative that you know, returns some of the money to lower-income people, but then use the rest to do things like fix the forests mm -hmm. that, that everybody you know, on both sides of the aisle could, mm -hmm. could support, mm -hmm. or maybe uh, build more reservoir capacity so if the snowpack decreases, we could store the water. Mm -hmm. so that, or another example would be to build the, sound, the, the light rail, the sound transit light rail, Build it 10 years faster so, so young people don't have to wait until they're 50 years old to see the light rail get completed. Mm -hmm. So there are some concrete things we could do with the money and not give the money to some board that might use the, the funds for uh, God knows what re kind, of a, kind of approaches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think needs to happen in, for us to move to a non or a bipartisan take on this? You know, we're so split right now. What are some practical steps that need to happen for us to get there? Well, what I think is necessary now is to have a moderate group come together. You know, see if we can get a bipartisan group of people to come together to, to come up with a plan, a moderate plan, that might be acceptable to the moderates on both sides mm -hmm. of the aisle. Mm -hmm. so I, and, in fact, there have been some meetings going on in the background after, after, 16, after 1631's de, uh, demise to try to do that. So I think n the moderates have to come together to come up with a plan. I think that's the next step. Will you have any involvement in that? What does your future look like? Well, I don't know what my future looks like, <laughs> but I have been involved in some of these meetings. Okay. So I, I certainly want to be helpful. But it's going to take, you know, people of, of various political directions, but moderates, inherent moderate, people who are willing to talk and compromise, they have to come together to do this. So you were interviewed by Washington Times, and um, I'm going to just read a quote that you, that you said in the interview. Um, it's really a minority of graduate students and just one or two faculty members um, that are real activists. I don't want to make it seem like everybody's like this. They're not. But it's poisoning the place. The fact that you've got to watch your step here. Um, I recently had a conversation with um, a political science um, professor at UPS, and she she wasn't free market. She didn't believe in the same values that Washington Policy Center did. But we sat down and we talked about how do we get rid of the silos that are on college campuses? These schools of thought that the students are captured in and they don't know the other side of the story and you know they're only being told one side one side of the picture and it's really not creating an environment of diverse thinking which 
I would say all, all college campuses went to Harvard, diverse thinking, um, intellectual thinking back and forth, um, good conversation um, that's not um, one-sided. So how do you see, how do you see us overcoming this, the, the poisonous, um, the poisonous uh, aura of like what's going on on campuses when you don't agree with someone? Well, you know, there's been a great deal of talk about diversity, you know, on campuses, in this campus. But I think what people have to think about is that diversity is more than the color of your skin or your sexual orientation or whatever. That diversity also is represented by your ideas and, 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 and how you think. And I think we have to really accept that now. Really think about diversity is looking at the world in different ways and coming from different political sides and, and different ideas. And I think th that's what needs to change. Mm -hmm. Do you see any, you know, things that UW does right that, um, that, that harbor this diversity you're talking about? Well, I mean, I, I see a few groups. Um, I, I mentioned there was a, a, a seminar before 1631 that was run by, uh, by uh, a, a, pro a professor of political science that was trying to get people to talk in a moderate way. So I think there are, are a few, few groups doing that. On the other hand, we're fighting against social media, which has really been pulling us apart. I mean, uh, social media, like Twitter particularly, has become extremely divisive. So we have some moderate voices, but then we have these powerful social media uh, approaches that are, that are really pulling us apart at the same time. And I, I heard from someone, uh, I was having like a small group discussion talking about how to revive civility in public discourse. And they were saying, you know, although social media has been a great platform for us, it's also diminished the relationships we have with people because rather than calling you racist or calling you names in person, which is much harder to do, you can do it on social media and get away with it. And there's really not much repercussion towards it. So, you know, I think that's one thing we need to work on is face-to-face -face interaction. When you just take the time to sit down with someone and look at them face-to-face -face in the eyes and understand, you know, they're, they're a person. Like, they, they care about the environment just as much as you do. They just have a different way of thinking about it, and if we can collaborate and come together, you know, maybe we can actually get somewhere with these initiatives. No, I think that's true, and I, I think the university has to come up with some kind, some policies. Um, there really is no policy about social media and freedom of speech, and this is something that 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 got me in trouble in the sense that here I am using a blog that's off campus. And it's completely separate from the university. But there are people here at the university, the chairman of my department and some of these students, who felt that I could be called accountable by them for my f political free speech outside. I think this is very serious. It is very important to protect free speech. And I think we've lost a lot in the, in the last few years. And, I, and I'm hoping the university will come up with a policy to protect free speech when we're talking off campus. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. I think wasn't your blog on Snowpacked, or you know, if listeners want to see that blog or look at some of your work you've done, how would they do that? Well, if they want to see my blogs, they're all on on online. So it, it, so if you go to uh, you know cliffmass.blogspot.com, okay, it's right there. Just search, search my name, you'll you'll find my blog right away. And so you'll find my blogs about weather, climate, and also about with some of these political issues like 1631. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Cliff, for um, just being a leader on this and for not not being making the situation more divisive, but trying to um, create unity and a, a bipartisan approach. I think we need that. We need more people like you, and we appreciate um, all the crap you've been given because of this and um, you taking the time to talk to us today. As we end our podcast, tell us something unique about yourself that listeners probably don't know. Well, one thing they might know is I was a student of Carl Sagan's, and I spent a lot of time with Carl Sagan. And one thing he impressed upon me is the importance of scientists interacting with the community, and that scientists can't go through the media, we have to go direct, and that we at times you know, should talk about the public policy issues. He was unafraid about that, and... and I learned that from him. So you know, a lot of what I'm doing was 
maybe inspired by my interactions with him many years ago. That's awesome. Well, thank you again, Professor Mass. We are thankful you were on our podcast today. Any last comments? No, thank you. This was a lot of fun. If you want to check out young professionals and get involved with what we're doing and come to some of our events, we bring in speakers like Professor Mass to um, give you um, information on both sides of the aisle. We do debates um, on campus. We have a University of Washington Young Professionals Club, an SU club, Gonzaga, a WSU club, and then we have our Young Professionals Program um, in Tri-Cities in Seattle. So check us out at WashingtonPolicy.org slash Young Professionals. Thank you, listeners.